All right, folks, sorry about that delay. We're going to go ahead and get started. And fortunately, since we're a little bit behind, rather than walking through uh, building a simple model, I'd like you to go ahead and jump on the L drive. And if you look under session 17, this is on the L drive, um, the C110 folder, session 17. There's a file called session 17 energy example, a folder. And go ahead and click on the, the file for step one, house to find. So what we see here is fairly simple geometry. It's probably like in the same vein as maybe your first project. Um, you can see we've got a, a simple sloped roof, some windows, a piece of curtain wall facing south. Uh, fairly simple floor plan. And what we're going to look at today is in the conceptual design stage, um, getting some visibility into potential energy performance. So there's some things we need to point out before, uh, before looking at Green Building Studio to look at energy analysis. And one of those things is how, how Revit uh, looks at volumes of spaces to do these, these sort of analyses on. Now, by default, actually currently in this, in this house, we don't have any rooms placed. So go ahead and jump over to your, to your room and area tab on the, or room and area button on the home tab and let's drop some rooms so these tags are just basic tags uh, native to the to the Revit environment but go ahead and click down to the room tag with volume and notice that when you do that it says that it's not computed and that's because by default just to make Revit run faster Rather than calculating volumes all the time, it just calculates the areas, unless you change the settings for that to turn on. So if you look over at this, again, down on the home tab under room and area, there's a, there's a small pull down area <coughs> under the room and area tab. And it says area and room volume computations. And notice that when it says for volume computations, the default, as mentioned, is areas only for faster performance. But when you're exporting to Green Building Studio for energy analysis, we need to start calculating those, those volumes. So go ahead and, and click that area and volumes. Click OK. And notice that it's now giving us some values on that room tag for the volumes of these two rooms that we've created. So while we're here, let's also give these spaces uh, some names beyond just the generic room that we've got here. And let's call this, um, let's call this a computer lab. And let's call this an office. And this will be helpful again when we get into the Green Building Studio environment because it will allow us to, to pull out our spaces and, and, make, and see what we're looking at. Now something else to be mindful of. Are the default height of rooms within Revit. If you look on the element properties for one of these rooms, you can see that the limit offset here is set at 10 feet. So what that's saying is that room, as it's calculated uh, with respect to volume, it's really just going up 10 feet. Even though maybe this roof slopes up higher than that, um, it wouldn't necessarily calculate that. And we can see that if you go into your View tab and drop a section. You can. So with these two windows tiled, you can see that if I, if I click on the room, 
It's really just stopping at that 10 foot, 10 foot level. So to change that, if you look at your element properties for that, for that room, rather than stopping at 10 feet, let's go up to like 30 feet. You could go higher, but that's pretty reasonable for the, for the slope roof that we have right now. And notice that what it's done is, rather than going up to 30 feet, it recognizes that the roof and the walls are containing that space, and it's modified that accordingly. And if you, if you notice that tab, the volume has changed the calculation here. So let's do the same thing for this office on the right side. It's still set at the 10 foot default. So go to your element properties. And let's change that parameter to 30 feet. Say OK. Yeah, Kelsey. <coughs> So there was an upper limit tab? Yeah. Oh, that's a good, that's a good question. Um, but I think even that, in this case, could be a little problematic. Because if you set your upper, lim upper limit to level 2, Oh, set the offset back to zero. So yeah, it's still only going up to level to level two, um, as defined there. So you mean just selecting selecting the room itself? Well, so you select the room, and then element properties, and then for your limit offset, just bump that up to thirty feet from the ten feet that was default. So this is a really important step to do before you export for energy uh, energy analysis. If you don't, then it's not going to really be giving you the full picture of how your building would perform because it's not accounting for that area that might be above just sort of a default a default height limit for that space. So be mindful of that. And it doesn't hurt, you know, if you're not sure, to cut some sections similar to this and just do a quick scan of your, uh, of your building. And one way that could be helpful to see that rather than picking rooms and seeing, you could go to your visibility settings and expand your rooms and check the interior fill. And then it would give you a reading on, on sort of how your, your rooms were stacking up. So if you're, especially if this were a large project, it would probably be a good call to, uh, to go ahead and set that visibility setting and then cut some sections just to make sure that you had done that for all your rooms, that, that things were looking good before you exported. So with that in place, what we're going to do is go to the, to the Revit tab in the top left of the screen and go down to export and GBXML. GBXML stands for Green Building Extensible Markup Language and it's essentially just a, a, a computer language that takes this 3D geometry and it sets these definitions for how it was created, the elements that are in it, what their properties are, and these are basically going to be put in a Green Building Studio to give us our energy analysis. So notice that the the GBXML uh, dialog that comes up, we've got some general parameters to look at. Uh, for right now, you know, this instead of office, let's say that it's uh, let's say that it's a school or university. Um, you can set location here, but you can also do it in Green Building Studio. So we're just going to do it there for right now. We're going to have that option when we import that in. Um, make sure you've got the right project phase when you're exporting. You know, it can be easy to, um, to let that one slip past you and maybe not get exactly what you wanted to export for analysis. Um, 
And then again, if you look over at details, you can get a sense of, of what exactly there is contained in this model. And it's really just looking at our spaces at the gross model level. So this all looks good. Uh, go ahead and click export. So I'm going to call this um, CE 110 class 2. I'm going to save that out. And now it's time to now it's time to jump into Green Building Studio. And to do that, we need to get on the internet. So if you go to gbs.autodesk.com, uh, you know currently I'm logged in under under Glenn's account, um, and we've actually just realized that the accounts that you use to get your software for this course on your student accounts. Um, there may be some of you, depending on when you got that software and when your trial started. Um, that you're now unable to actually use Green Building Studio. So you might get an error message. You know, this is saying that the trial expires in 30 days. This was an account that, that Glenn set up on the fly when we realized this issue. Um, but it'll give you 30 days to play around with this. And that's enough time uh, for you to use this service on your next project, um, which we'll be handing out soon. But long, st long story short, what you have right now may not work. What you might need to do is set something to your Gmail account and go ahead and get this trial, trial version active for the next 30 days. Uh, it used to be that all this was free for students, but something must have changed recently. So uh, sorry for any of that confusion, but uh, it might involve setting up uh, yet another account with Autodesk so that you can have access to the software. So we'll send out some instructions about rejecting the URL you would go to to set up a new account for that. <coughs> all right, so let's, let's start poking around Green Building Studio and see what this is all about. Um, if you go over to My Projects, um, we have a button to create a new project. Go ahead and click on that. Um, and let's call this, um, I'm just going to call this CE210 class 2. Um, let's go ahead and call it a school again, school or university. And notice that a lot of these options that we have are similar to what we saw when we were looking at Vasari, which was that conceptual energy analysis tool. The two are very much linked. Uh, Vasari basically exports into G Green Building Studio for its analysis results, just like this. Um, so again, for schedule, you have the ability to, to take a look at how the building is operated, how many hours of the day, how many days a week. Um, let's just say for right now, this is a 12-7 facility. Um, and let's go ahead and choose demonstration only. Um, Click Next, and it's asking us for a, lo uh, for a location. And for the purposes of this right now, let's pick somewhere that's kind of cold, um, and let's just say Chicago. And it's going to give you a Google map where you can locate it. I'm just going to take wherever the first place it gives me is. That's, that's fine in the interest of time, so we can cover all this. Good question. So the question was, is there a way that you can just use the Green Building Studio software that's on the computer instead of this? But Green Building Studio is actually software as a service. Um, so all the engines that are running these analyses are up in the cloud, um, which means that you, you pretty much have to use the online service. You do have a client on your server or on your computer that uh, is basically the intermediary between the file that you export from Revit uh, to where you send it up in the cloud. But you actually do have to use the online service for this sort of thing. So notice before, before it lets you click next, you have to verify that this is indeed your correct project location. Go ahead and click on that. Some lawyers had a, a heyday um, you know, making sure that Autodesk was protected from clients 
receiving energy analysis results only to find that that's not actually how it worked in the field. And so, you know, some of these things are experimental in nature. And just like anything, when it comes to energy modeling, um, things can always kind of change from what you think they might be in, in early or even uh, late design and construction document phases. Um, but the next screen that it's giving us is uh, selecting a weather station that's close. I'm just going to go ahead and pick the one that's closest to us. But if you were working on a project where you felt like uh, one of those other ones that were further away better represented the site conditions of your building, uh, it might be appropriate to go ahead and choose those. But I'm going to go ahead and pick that one and say next. And it's going to give us a basic overview of our project, latitude, longitude, longitude um, city, state, country, um, along with the Illinois state average for utilities for both electric and, and gas. Um, now, again, these are averages. If you know that you happen to be in a location where that would be different and you have that access to the information, you're, you can override these, these defaults. But for what we're doing right now, we're just going to accept that and click Next. And then right here, again, another little disclaimer before we move on. Uh, go ahead and click this on the bottom tab, the center one, saying that you're authorized to accept these terms. And click Next. OK, and it says a project has been created. But really, what this is, it's just kind of a shell of a project. It doesn't have a, Greek, a GBXML file to link up to it. It's really just kind of created the framework for what we're going to do. So now that this is under control, we need to jump into that uh, the uh, desktop client. And most of you should probably have this on your, on your computers. But some of you may not, unfortunately. Um, so it's called the Green Building Studio Desktop. It should be under the Autodesk. Glenn, I'm having a little trouble finding Green Building Studio desktop client oh, no on your computer. Uh, the real key is go back over to the Windows partition. Is that here? Yep, it's where you were. Okay, and let's just shrink rather out of the way for right now. Oh, uh, okay. So you're running. Okay, got it. You're running parallels. Yeah. So it's going to shrink rather out of the way. Sure. And actually, you can just uh, close that. Just shrink it down to the oh, yeah. taskbar. And you can even close that one down and shrink it down. Cool. And where'd it go? It is. Start. Mm -hmm. There we go. Yeah. So yeah, it should have a little, little icon like this, the Autodesk Green Building Studio 2010 desktop. Let's go ahead and click on that. Go ahead and click OK. Oh, I guess. So Glenn, Glenn is, the, uh, is the account that's set into your login the same as the new one that you just made? Oh, that's different. <laughs> and do you remember your password, that's more importantly? Question. Let's try this. I think I called myself Vcast VBS. And I think this is this password. Let's does see. it need a, a email address behind it? I think it does sometimes, no? No, uh, I no? think this is actually. OK. Great, go. awesome. All right, so again, you're going to use that same login uh, that you used for, um, for Green Building Studio or for the, the Autodesk login. Um, and notice that we've got, in this little project pull down, it's got the project that we just created, that shell of the project, the, the CE210 class 2. And we need to create a new run, but we have to attach a GBXML file to that. And we're going to do that. I just finding that file that you created. <laughs> Click open. And we're ready to go. After you've got that that um, 
that file identified, go ahead and click Create New Run. And it's sending that file up to the cloud and it's running this analysis using a, a DOE 2.2 simulation running off of Energy Plus. So it's actually asking me to sign in again, Glenn. Can you, can you lay your credentials on me? I'll leave it nice and down for you. <laughs> cool. Thanks. Uh, yeah. Here you go. Yeah? All right. All right, so let's... Let's poke around and see what we've got here. And I will say just, just really br briefly, we're running a little short on time. It's almost 3.05. And if, if you need to leave, I understand if you wouldn't mind leaving quietly. But I would suggest, if you can, stick around for another five minutes and just getting a little bit more detail about what this is. It's going to come in helpful for your assignment. Uh, but if you do have to go for class or whatever, please leave quietly. And there will be videos online uh, if you need to catch up. But uh, it would probably be good to stick around for just a minute longer um, than what we have blocked out for class. But Looking at these results, you can see as far as headings, we've got energy and carbon, uh, water usage, lead daylighting credits. Uh, so different things related to sustainability that might be of use to you uh, in the coming assignment. But basically, from this energy run, we're given an annual energy cost based on those, uh, based on those fuel and electricity rates that we had, a life cycle cost for the building, assuming somewhere there's a, oh, the assumptions basically lets you know some of the some of the assumptions it's using. It's a 30-year building life with a 6.1% discount rate for those of you struggling through engineering economy right now. It's good reinforcement for that. It's what they're what they're using to do these uh, these analyses. It's giving you uh, your annual CO2 emissions due to electricity, fuel, and then relating that to um, you know give you sort of a way to visualize that SUVs um, it's giving you your annual energy use and then your life cycle energy as well. And then also looking down a little bit, you can see that it's giving you some information on your the water efficiency, um, again, running on some basic assumptions, the photovoltaic poten uh, potential of your building. And that's a little strange that that's coming back as zero. Um, Maybe there was some sort of error in the model that I had done. Do you know why that might have happened? Well, that's all coming back as zero for the photovoltaic potential. No, I've not no, seen that one happen that's before. That's sure. Um, but then we've also got some charts that give you some insight into basically how energy is used within that. Actually, that, that idea is we, we turn on because it's, it's because that roof is all facing the north. Essentially, the slope of the roof is all facing north. Sure. What it's basically telling you is none of the roof surface is really worthwhile relative to paying back within either 30 or 50 years of super threshold for generating photovoltaic given the way the roof is lo located right now. So we, we sort of bias towards southern sun, but we actually sort of killed any photovoltaic potential of the roof. At the top of the so it's giving you your annual electric and uh, fuel end uses, a basic view, and then you can also get into more detail if you're curious about what that other category might be. Uh, same with your fuel use, but now that we've got this baseline, what what you can do is essentially create runs off of that. So again, what we've got here was built off some basic assumptions for things like 
how the building was operated, the space type, the lighting and equipment power densities, um, the sensible and latent heat by the occupants inside. No, it's, it's a series of assumptions, but if you have uh, information that overrides what those assumptions may be, you can go in and, and override those, those sort of things. Hmm. So what we want to do is create a design alternative where we modify one thing about our model that we've got right now. And is, Quinn, is this, is this the area where I create that? Oh, so I've got a, you select your, you select your run and then create a design alternative from that. And let's take a look at the things, the kind of things that you can, that you can modify. Um, you know, in a, in a piece of new construction, given a, a new building, you could change the rotation and maybe see if orientation affects your annual energy use, if you can better capture the, the incident solar, uh, solar radiation and maybe use some of that for um, passive heating. But in this case, for your next project, that may not be the best thing to look at because you're, you're working, we're working with an existing building and you're probably not going to have much chance of making a cost effective picking up a massive commercial building and rotating it 20 degrees. So it might be in better in your interest to maybe looking at uh, taking a look at maybe your roof or your wall constructions. And for this example, let's go ahead and um, instead of using the default uh, um, insulation value for the, for, the, for the walls, let's go ahead and choose one of these structurally insulated panels, which have a lot of insulation in them, or, or uh, you see them used typically in high-performance buildings that kind of wrap the building in an envelope that's like a thermos to really keep, uh, uh, keep heat in the building. Um, so let's go ahead and do that. And let's also use some, use some, since we're in a cold climate. Why don't you go just do the panels for the, the July 4th just like the back? Sure. Yeah. Sure. So on the northern, the southern, the western, and the eastern walls. Let's call it SIPs, Structurally Insulated Panels. Let's add that alternate. And then, unfortunately, we don't have time to do a lot of, a lot of alternatives. Let's just go ahead and look at this one. But then you know, I think you get the, the picture that you can go in here and change some of these parameters, like lighting, roof. Um, envelope enclosures and, and get a sense of what that might do for you. The trick being, once you run these, you really want to be methodical in your approach. You don't want to go changing too many parameters because it's going to be hard to isolate what the results are because of what you did. You want to be um, kind of incremental in your approach to, to doing some of these analyses. Yeah, if you go to the right and you go to your project runs, we see now some differences in the, the annual energy cost, uh, both with respect to fuel and, and elect electricity. Uh, it's interesting we still got the same peak demand, but um, you know, because we didn't really change any of the orientation, it's still the same shell. Um, but then the energy use intensity, which is sort of a normalizing effect of uh, looking at the amount of uh, energy used within a building on a per square foot basis, uh, the structurally insulated panels has a much lower energy use intensity uh, on a sort of heating value per square foot per year basis. One thing, something that's kind of interesting to do is if you click over on this compare tab, it essentially zeroes out all the values in your baseline run so that you can see the incremental savings or, or losses due to the measures that you took. And we can see here in terms of an energy cost, we're saving $200, $200 a year. Um, 
we're spending a little bit more on our electricity, but we're saving a lot on our fuel costs, most likely something like natural gas. Um, so this is the methodology that we'd like you to use on your, uh, on your next project, which we'll be handing out on Thursday. Um, and I think, given the time, let's go ahead and wrap. We have a preview of where this is going to go.